I think there's something in every one of us that longs for something more. I hear it in talking with people about life. We aren't, we aren't satisfied always with where we are and with what we have. What we expected and what actually happens are rarely the same. And our expectations exceed the reality of what is. Has that ever happened to you? Where your expectations haven't been met. You aren't quite sure what should have happened, but what did happen wasn't what you thought should happen. And so you're disappointed. As people, we're hampered by the limitations of our humanity. We need to be clear about that. But even with that, we still don't want to settle for things as they are. We don't want to settle for things as they have been. There must be something more. In John 11, Jesus shows us that there is something more. And you may want to make sure you turn to that. However, you, uh, if it's a paper copy, an electronic copy, be there in John 11 just to be able to see what unfolds as we talk about that passage today. As Jesus performs the most incredible of his amazing miracles when he raises a dear friend named Lazarus from the dead. Jesus shows us who he is in this miracle. With every miracle, Jesus has been showing us something about who he is. And in the middle of this chapter, he's going to tell us that he is the resurrection and he is the life. He's the one that allows us to stand beside a coffin, as many of us did with Fern over the last couple of days, and to be able to expect that God will meet us in hope. He shows us there who he is. He shows us what he can do in our lives. He just has a different way in John 11 of showing it, and it's very different different from what the people who are involved in the miracle expected what would happen. We're just going to dive right into this this morning. Verse 1, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Uh, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the, love you, the one you love is sick. When he heard it, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. This is the first place where what happens is not what people thought was going to happen. They're caught completely off guard. And we're going to break this down into four different stages that we'll examine both today and then next week as we conclude this section of the Gospel of John that brings us right to the brink of the events during the last week of Jesus' life. The miracle begins with Jesus waiting. My friend Lazarus is sick. I'll just stay here. And as we work our way through the miracle and what Jesus does, we're going to witness Jesus working in ways that are amazing, they're unexpected, and they're downright confusing. And this first stage catches us off guard. The need is real. It is urgent. Lazarus is desperately ill. He needs help, and he needs it yesterday. And with precision, John details who Lazarus is and how special he is to Jesus. He identifies Lazarus as being from Bethany, a town within easy walking distance of Jerusalem. Bethany is the place where Mary and her sister Martha live. Jesus has interacted with these two women before. Remember when Martha complained about how she had to do all the work while Mary sat listening to Jesus teach. And Jesus is friends with all three of them. Lazarus is the friend that Jesus deeply loves. Not just loves, but deeply. 
And because they lived near Jerusalem, it appears Jesus found their home to be a place where he could retreat when he was in Jerusalem. John also makes sure we know who Mary is. This is the same woman who is going to anoint Jesus' feet with expensive ointment in the next chapter. And so with his historical vantage point, as he writes looking back, he, he gives us a, a, a marker point here, a famous incident that hasn't yet taken place to give us a sense of where we are and who we're dealing with as an anchor point. Because it's important to know which of the many women in the New Testament named Mary this is. This is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is not Mary Magdalene. This is Mary, the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus. And the three of them are very special friends of Jesus. He has spent time with them. He has ministered to them. And they have also ministered to him. And it's these people with whom he shared life. They're the ones who have a serious problem. Lazarus is ill, and without help, he's going to die. And the sisters, I, I visualize this, it's almost like they send up their bat signal. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. <laughs> they send that word. There have been several times over the years for me when the phone rings in the middle of the night. It may be because of a serious illness, or it might be an accident, someone who's really struggling, and the question is, can you come? How soon can you be here? I have to admit, it makes a difference when the, the person calls, it's someone that I know, and even more so if I know them well, well, of course I'll come. I'll be there as soon as I can, and I'm on the way. Now, if I don't know who the person is, I still often go, but my attitude is very different. For example, I'll never forget the person in California as an example. Uh, this was back in the day when we had phone books. Remember phone books? You know, somehow, uh, he, we lived in Sunnyvale. Palo Alto was a couple of towns up the peninsula. Somehow, he'd uh, put it together. He'd found my name in the phone book. And the phone rings, and he says, uh, I was wondering if you could help. I've locked myself out of my apartment, and I need someone to come and meet the locksmith to pay them so that I can get back in. And it was a Saturday night going toward a Sunday morning, and I'm thinking tomorrow's Sunday, but I still decided, well, I'll go. And I have to say, my attitude wasn't the best when I finally got home about three hours later at 4 a.m., but I went. And that's why it's so jolting when Jesus says he's going to wait. He tells the disciples that he knows what God is doing, that this isn't going to end in death. It's going to end in God's glory. But they're still seeing this very differently. And intellectually, I understand this. I understand that Jesus, who is both God and man, he sees and he knows more than we do. And I can wait patiently upon him and I can trust him because he can look ahead and he can see how God is going to work. And then he decides to stay put for the next two days. And so emotionally... It's a struggle to understand why Jesus waits. And the reality is, Lazarus dies. Uh, we're going to read about that later in this chapter before Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. We know that's coming. The disciples didn't. Mary and Martha didn't. Certainly Lazarus didn't. But Lazarus dies, and Jesus tells his disciples it's not going to end in death. It's just that the end of the story is going to be life that ends in God's glory, but getting there is going to be what none of them expected. The challenge for the disciples and for Mary and Martha, it didn't feel like what should have been happening. Jesus, we sent for you. We'll see that next Sunday. Where were you? What were you doing? What could have been more important? 
And I'm right there with them when I read this, trying to see it for the first time, wondering, Jesus, what are you doing? In looking at this account and reflecting back on John 9, for example, when Jesus healed the man born blind so the work of God could be displayed, there's a question that needs to be asked by us. It needs to be asked of Jesus. It's actually questions. Did God cause these situations somehow? Does God cause Lazarus to go through this illness and then die so, simply so he can bring glory to himself? Does God cause illness and death? As you read the Bible, you will find God rarely causes illness. He does cause illness and disasters on rare occasions as punishment for sin. Moses' sister Miriam is an example. When out of jealousy, she opposed Moses' leadership. God afflicted her with leprosy. God also healed her when Moses cried out, Oh God, please heal her. It does happen. There are other examples in the Old Testament with serpents going through the camp, biting people because of their sin. And then, of course, there's Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5 where they try to deceive and God takes their lives. God does cause illness, but it's extremely rare. Illness is usually the result of the fact that we live in a fallen world, a broken world. It is the result of sin, but it's not directly a punishment for sin. We all face illnesses. Some of you are facing illnesses today. And in those illnesses, we need to realize that this world is not all that there is. We are promised that there is a day coming when there will be no more tears, no sickness, no pain. And for those of you I've talked with already this morning who have back pain, you can say, praise God, that day is coming, but I'd like to experience here now. We look forward to that, but don't miss this. God is looking forward to that day with us too. Jesus says what is happening with Lazarus is going to be for God's glory. Now, I'm staying with this for a while because this is exactly what some of us need to understand. Jesus hears Lazarus is sick, and he stays right where he is for two more days. He loved, but he waited. And so don't let the brightness of the miracle that's out ahead divert your attention from the reason for the miracle. Jesus loved Lazarus. He works miracles in lives of people because he loves them. But for now, love waits. And I wonder why. Why would Jesus do this? Don't miss the point. Jesus was meeting their deepest need instead of satisfying their immediate wants. He was meeting their deepest need that he knows, instead of satisfying their immediate wants of what they want right now. Because this is what love does. It seeks to meet the deepest need instead of responding always to the immediate want. Moving through the chapter, we're going to see Jesus' love for his friends. Jesus waits because it's the right thing to do for all who are involved. Jesus waits because he understands God's timing for everyone involved. John has made it evident several times in his account of Jesus' life that Jesus does things on his timetable and for God's purpose and not necessarily what people expect or when they want it. In chapter 2, his mother, remember when she said, we're at a wedding? These are good friends. Uh, They've run out of wine. A miracle is needed now. And Jesus makes it clear. He gives the wine, but he says, I work on my timetable. Later in John 7, his brothers insisted that Jesus go with them to the festival in Jerusalem. They were hoping that something dramatic was going to happen. But he waited Because their timing and their motives weren't aligned with his. He still went. He followed later secretly. And here, a friend is in need. But Jesus is on his timetable, God's timetable, as he waits two days. 
In talking about waiting for God to work, this is a practical lesson many of us need. There are going to be times when you have to wait for God to do His work in your life. That's not fun. It will raise questions. I dare to admit it can even cause doubt. Well, God, what's taking place? When you are waiting for God to work, there are three factors to keep in view. The first factor is this. Make sure it's God you're waiting for. Be careful to make sure you're not using God as an excuse to try to get what you want or using God even more as an excuse to not do what you need to do. It can be very practical. Very early in ministry, I had gone up to a woman at our church in Denver, and I just said, it is the policy here at First Free Methodist Church that if you have kids in the nursery, that you're expected to take a turn in helping all, to watch all of the other kids. Her answer to me was, well, I've prayed about this, and God has made it clear to me that that's not his will for me in my life at this time. <laughs> she didn't want to do it. And I said, well, I have prayed about this too, and God has made it clear that we're not expected to watch your kids any longer in the nursery. You know, so people will say they're waiting on God when the truth of the matter is they're waiting on themselves. And it needs to be clear that you are waiting on something that fits into the will of God instead of some selfish motive. That's an important key. Is it selfish or selfless? That's often the dividing line between knowing, is it God's will or my will? Make sure it's God you're waiting for. Second factor, pray for God's glory. This should be the ultimate motive. Even while you wait, don't pray first for things to start moving. Pray first that God would receive glory as a result of what happens. That's where faith really meets the road. There will be times when God's glory is the growth that you experience while you wait. God's will is being done and His work is being accomplished even while you wait. However, let me be clear. I hate to wait. Any of you like that? Third factor, trust his timing. God knows more than you and I know. Amen? Amen. He knows far more about the circumstances than we know. And so we're told, trust. Trust his timing. This is our first lesson. Jesus waited, <coughs> then he went. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back. And so now, now they're arguing the other way with him. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see, they see by this world's light. There's a distinction there. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And now the disciples are totally confused. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. And John, writing this, would have been one of those thinking that. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. 
There are some significant insights to be gleaned from this fascinating conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. After two days, Jesus says, let's go. His disciples demonstrate how protective they've been becoming of Jesus. They point out, Jesus, you're not all that popular in Judea. It wasn't that long ago they were going to stone you. Maybe not the best idea to go there. And Jesus follows this by pointing out how there's 12 hours of daylight and how you're not as likely to stumble as you would be walking around at night. And what is this all about? Two points Jesus makes. First, he's talking about timing again. He states factually how there are 12 hours of daylight and only 12. Jesus' point is there is enough time. There is enough time to do God's will, but there isn't enough time to waste it. He may have waited for two days, but he now makes clear this needs to be done now. Jesus knows what's going to happen, and it goes far beyond Lazarus having been sick. There is a cross that's waiting for him ahead as he goes, and there have been several times when the religious leaders have tried to arrest him and, or attack him. It didn't happen because it wasn't time yet. Now it's time. It's time to go. It's time to do God's will. He's also talking about staying in God's will. You can walk in the light and not stumble, but you can also walk at night and stumble because there is no light. Some of the eeriest photos of southwest Florida after Hurricane Ian were the satellite photos at night. While lights are shining in all other parts of the country, you looked at that part of Florida and all there was was darkness. It's dangerous to walk when there's no light. And so Jesus makes the point, the greatest danger in life is not walking in the light God has given you. Walk in that light. If you walk away from his light, even if it seems to be the safer, wiser option, it's not. You may suffer in the light, but that's better than stumbling in the dark. That not only hurts physically, but it also hurts your soul. It's better to suffer in the light than to stumble in the dark. The disciples are concerned for Jesus' safety, but Jesus needs them to know the time has come. It's time to go. And this is when the conversation gets even stranger. Jesus tells them Lazarus has fallen asleep. The disciples pick up on that point. They know that sleep often precedes getting better, so there's no reason to go. He's just going to get better. And Jesus now makes it clear. He died, and I'm glad that this has happened because this is so that you may believe. I'm glad I wasn't there so that, guys, you can believe. There are some hard days coming. You need to believe. Everything Jesus is doing is to build their faith so they're as ready as they can be for what's coming. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, he says, well, let us go too, and we'll die right along with him. They've been expressing their concern for Jesus' safety, but they also know Judea is going to be a dangerous place for them as well. And so as Thomas looks around at the other disciples, uh, he says what they're all feeling, are we going to go, guys? Okay, let's all let's agree. We're going to go, and if we have to die, that's what we'll do. They're resigned to that fact. That's so full of faith. His faith is courageous. It's just not very triumphant. But he does have courage. He's willing to die. One commentator observes Thomas didn't have expectant faith here. He had loyal despair. Sometimes maybe loyal despair is the best we can give. I'm impressed that he's ready to go because he thinks there's no hope. Oh, Jesus is going to show them hope. And so Jesus is at the end of the conversation with his disciples, and we're at the end of what we're going to do here today. He has waited, but now he's going to go be with his friends. It's unsafe. He knows it. And Jesus teaches us an invaluable life principle. It's this. Love pays the price instead of playing it safe. He goes into that danger. They all know it. And what happens next when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it's going to be the straw that breaks the proverbial camel's back as far as the relationship between Jesus and the religious leaders. In spite of that, 
love goes. Love pays the price. Never take that for granted. On this Sunday before Thanksgiving, I'm so grateful for how the love of Jesus paid the price. We are to trust his timing because love pays the price. So we're going to pause here at the end of the service today and we're just going to thank him. You can bow your head and your heart before him. The one who knows more than you do, the one who loves you beyond anything in any way that anyone can love. And we can certainly give that thanks with our lips, the praise of our lips. Take just a moment. Tell Jesus you're grateful for his love for you. That you're grateful that love is always willing to pay the price. And that he paid the price for you. And if you haven't allowed him to pay the price for you, maybe this is the day where you realize, Jesus, I need your love in my life in that way. I wait upon you for that today. And so we can do that with the praise of our lips. But it's even better to do it with our actions. Is there someone in your life where God is calling you to reach out and to love them? Paul made that challenge earlier in the service to pray for one person. For one person to be able to demonstrate God's love and to be willing to pay that price so that they would have the opportunity of knowing the love of Jesus in their life. It may be your spouse. It may be a family member, someone you go to school with or work with, a neighbor. Talk to Jesus about that person for the next 30 seconds. Jesus, when it comes to expectations and disappointment, I have to think that there must be times when you're disappointed because what you've expected from us as your people, it all just kind of falls flat. We have the best of intentions. We're ready, we think, but then so many times we just never do. And so we just are ready, God, for you to move us in that direction where we can reach out and let the people in our community know how much you, our God, are for them, how much you desire that they would know your love and your hope and your joy and your peace. And that's the mission that you've given to us. And you're expecting, you're expecting that we would go. And so we just want to reaffirm to you, our Lord, today, we love you for loving us in that way. And we again devote ourselves to that mission that you've given to us. We want to bring glory to your name. May it always be for your glory, the glory of God, the God who loves us. And it is Jesus in your name we pray.